everybody. Hope you're doing marvellously well. I'm sitting here with my good friend, the rather wonderful Mr. Adam Steele. Adam, how are you? I am good, Warren. Thank you very much. Oh, I see how you have a you? cup of tea going. I do. It's the most ridiculously English thing. Would you believe cherry Bakewell flavoured tea? <laughs> You've got to send me some. I don't have that. I'm just a, I'm just a PG tips man. I'm a, I'm a humble, straightforward, regular tea guy. Usually a coffee guy, but at this time of night, because the time difference, that would kill me. So something a little bit more fancy. So you've done an amazing uh, Reaper course with us, which is absolutely incredible, because you are a sort of, um, I don't know, you're, you're a Reaper aficionado, is the way I'm going to describe you. So I have been told. <laughs> so I've been told. So I wanted to point out that I subtly, I think subtly, posted kind of polls everywhere. I did one on our Twitter, one on Instagram, and one in our community page on YouTube. And we got about two or 3,000 responses, which is thank amazing. Thank you ever so much for everybody responded. And we discovered after cal carefully calculating it, that about 30% of the people that responded use Reaper. So that's a lot of people. So there has been some updates in Reaper. So you have thrown those into the course. Is that correct? Indeed. When we did the course, Reaper 6.0 was on the cusp of coming out. It actually came out during the filming for the course. Uh, since then, we're now up to Reaper 6.3. And there's been quite a few really cool uh, new things like there's LUFS metering and all that kind of stuff. And so we decided it was high time that we made an update for the course that is now included in there that talks about some of the key new features. Not every tiny little thing, but the things that really matter to people who use it on a day-to-day -day basis. Fantastic. And in the meantime, ladies and gentlemen, Adam is going to take us through four things that he believes makes Reaper stand out. And obviously he's not alone. Where 30% of the people who respond say they use Reaper, that's a pretty huge deal. So Adam? So uh, Reaper does some awesome things. It's a digital audio workstation, just like every other digital workstation in some ways. They all have to do the same things, play your sounds, be able to edit, delete, copy, whatever. They all do the same things until we start looking at the cool stuff. Now, today I'm gonna to show you some of the nice little features that I've found in Reaper that I don't think you'll find anywhere else. And at the very least, you won't find across the board, across every DAW. If you find one of these really cool features in another DAW, I pretty much guarantee you won't find all of them in one. DAW. So Reaper brings all the cool features of everything together and more. So without further ado, let's go. Now, the first thing that I want to show you is a thing called Spectral Peaks. Uh, it's something I talk about a lot on my own channel, and uh, it's something that saves me a lot of time, especially in editing. Now, if we look at this project, this is a song called Watch the World by Mesetto. Nice song. Um, but this was recorded back before Spectral Peaks was a thing, and I mean like 10 years ago. That's a cool thing about Reaper, by the way, is that there's no problems with forward and backward compatibility. This project is nearly 10 years old and just opened. Anyway, uh, we can see that there are loads of takes on here. There are lots of pretty colours and lots of effects going on. Oh, another side thing while I'm getting distracted is this is a 4K screen. Uh, feel free to watch this on a 4K monitor. You'll be able to see some really, really sharp detail because Reaper handles 4K incredibly well. Uh, so uh, you'll see how there are different colors. This is right in the middle. I'm going to make this bigger. This is the main vocal for the verses. And you can see how it's got different colors on it. And those different colors are the different takes. Now, I know that Cubase has a system where you can pick takes in lanes. I know that uh, Pro Tools has its own system. Most of them have their own system for picking takes. So that's not what I'm going to show you. What I'm going to show you, firstly, let's consolidate these into, or well, crop to active take, because this song, I know which takes I'm gonna use. Now, if I stare at this, it looks like a waveform. Colorful and pretty, but it's a waveform and not a lot else. Spectral peaks. What I'm going to do is select all this and go to view uh, peaks display settings and change this to spectral peaks. This is going to take a second because this is an old project that didn't have this enabled. It's going to go through and check out all the files. And you'll see now that where these files were just a block, now they're a pretty rainbow. 
We can change the, the colors however we like. We can make them look bigger and smaller like we kind of know they did. Please, of course, uh, we can change how bright we want these colors to be. Uh, we can change where the colors are if you suffer from a specific color blindness or anything like that. You can change all those details. But what's important to me is the different colors that are on here now represent certain frequency ranges. Millisecond to millisecond, whatever is the most dominant frequency is the one that shows up in a particular color. Now you think, oh, what do you do? That's pretty, but what use is that to me? Uh, this is something that saves me a lot of time uh, because you, you, after a while of learning uh, to look at certain instruments in certain ways, you learn to be able to read this. Uh, it's a bit like the Matrix, you know, all I, all I see is, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, this light blue here, that's a sibilant. Um, if there's a dark patch anywhere, quite often those are, if there's been a bump on the mic, you'll see subsonic frequencies. Um, if there's a really big belt of a note, that will come out a different note to something lower down. If I solo this, I will guarantee you this blue bit here, I'm just going to move it over to the left of the screen, that blue bit, that's a sibilant. Yeah, we all drown. Yeah. The J of drown, there was a sibilant. Now, in this case, I've already got a ds -er going on, so it's not overbearing, but it's good to be able to see those things, especially if, let's say you've got a group harmony and you've got 10 vocals, 12 vocal performances going on. One's got an overbearing sibilant, and you don't want to paste DSs across everything. What do you do? Uh, you have to listen to them one by one by one by one to see which one it is. Not anymore. If you've got a block of them with the spectral peaks, you can see where that is, or so let's say one's out of time with the others, uh, you can see very clearly where those blue bits, if they don't align, you can see it's that one. Or on a, on a bass, if you can see there's a particular fret squeak. So, or on a guitar, I can see chug 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 yellow i mean this is this is dimmed because it's muted but that green bit right there that's a shink, uh, which in this context of the performance was acceptable but if you get something like on an acoustic guitar you've got really bad squeaks or like on the bass here i've got one note that seems to have gone into really sub territory it just seems to have dropped um it just must have caught a harmonic in, again, in the context of this mix, that's okay. But if you hear a problem somewhere, you can very quickly, in a lot of cases, see them and fix them. Like, that, see that? That's the that that's where there's a really high bass note, and I've really had to use a limiter from Brainworks here to keep that under control. But if you're not wanting to use too much. Uh, processing, compression, limiting, all that kind of stuff. Uh, this can cut down on production time because you can see where there are issues. Uh, that way as well, um, if if the guitar player comes back into the control room after a long, long take and says, there was a fret squeak in there, can I hear if it was okay? And you go, where was it? And he goes, I don't know, somewhere near the first verse. You can spend two minutes going before the first verse and playing through and listening and listening and listening. Or you can use spectral peaks and go, there it is. Do you mean this? Play it back. And they go, yeah, that's the one. Sounds fine. Or oh, let's redo it. And it might sound like it saves you a few seconds, but every few seconds saved makes my day go from a 10 hour day to an eight hour day. I get to go home and see my family. Little things like that that save me time whilst getting the same job done, but better in the moment. L taking these little things out. Absolutely anything like this is worth it to me. Here's another thing that Reaper can do that I don't know if any other DAW can do nearly this powerfully. Um, I know that a lot of DAWs can render things like stems. So let's say we've got these drums. I want to export all of these drums and a couple of these guitar parts. Now, if I go into the render window with a keyboard shortcut, then I can go to render stems and that will render those bits out. And that's all well and good. And that saves a lot of time. I can have them automatically name themselves with wildcards so that they're properly named without me having to do 47 different stupid names, which again, I know that things like Cubase have this, but then we go into the regions, which are again like Cubase's cycle markers, 
I can then export different parts of those. There's also a thing in here, which is where Reaper gets really powerful, which is the region render matrix. So the region render matrix, and I've only got three uh, regions right now. Let's say that I had like 20 tracks in here uh, in the same project. I know some people don't work like that, but let's say for argument's sake, this is a mastering project and you've got, yeah, 10. So I might want to export the master mix for all 10 of these, but I might also want to select all the tracks for export for these. But then how about for this song, uh, we didn't have uh, this guy playing guitar, so those would be wasted empty space. Uh, for these, I don't want uh, that f um, track apart from on that one. Uh, the effects, I only use these effects, etc, etc, etc. And that will then render all of those files uh, in as fast a time as it possibly can, whilst I go and make a coffee and go and do something else. And as an extra bonus, there's this thing called the render queue. And the render queue, it's a little queue that comes up here. Uh, let's say you're the kind of guy who, instead of having 10 songs in the same project, let's say you have 10 projects. This is another great time saver. Um, if you're working with a band, you've done 10 tracks with them, and they call you afterwards and they go, that was great. Can we just turn down the bass a little bit and turn the guitars up a little bit in every track? This is not an uncommon thing for me. I'm sure a lot of you have experienced this as well. Um, so you open up one project, you do the fixes, you render it, that takes three minutes. You then open up the next one, you render it, that takes three minutes. And that has then taken you 40 minutes, 45 minutes, just to make some simple changes. What you can do with the render queue is if I go to my render window, like the bounce window, export window, like you would in any other DAW, uh, once I've decided file formats, all that kind of stuff, instead of hitting render, I can now go to queued renders and add it to the render queue. And what's more, if I'm using things like virtual drums, I can add a delay so that it will give the project 30 seconds, 60 seconds, whatever I tell it, to load all the samples up so we're not having any weird missing sample issues. I could do that 10 times for all those different uh, projects for the different songs. And then hit do the render queue and then whilst I go and do something else whether it's reply to my emails whether it's go and make a coffee whether it's spend time with the family again the computer will then one by one each each project open them all up render them all without me being there and that means that I can then leave that as an unattended job because those few minutes in between every time they add up and it's not enough time for me to focus on something else. You know, if you hit render and it takes three minutes, that's not long enough to write a full email uh, a lot of the time. Uh, and then repeat, repeat, repeat. Whereas if I can do that all as a batch job, I can have tens or hundreds of, of cues and just write that time off and then just do that in a block. Here's another thing that's a simple one, but is really, really, really powerful. Uh, this project that I'm running in. This was with this was tracked at 44.1 kilohertz. So if I hit play everything plays perfectly well. Now in most DAWs if I change the sample rate of this project what's gonna happen? Usually um, either it doesn't like it at all or it plays the samples of all the sounds back at really weird rates, so you hear really weird slowdowns or really weird speed ups. Uh, some DAWs, then you have to manually resample every file just to get them to work, which you think, oh, we'll go and work back at the original sample rate then. Sure, but what if I'm mixing for a band and the guitar player sends me his tracks at 48k, Drummer sends me his tracks at 44. Singer sends me his stuff at 96, etc., etc. Um, you have to resample it all, not in Reaper. Watch what happens if I open my settings and change this to 48. It just carries on regardless. If I make one of these a little bigger, you'll see these little blue information check boxes that say each one of these is resampled from 44.1k uh, but it's not 
actually processing the file separately. It's doing it live on the fly, completely resampling in real time, which means whatever happens, the project will just play. Sometimes I work with systems that are fixed at a certain sample rate. It's not ideal, but the fact that Reaper will just open it and play it at the correct pitch and everything like that means I can get a project working. Sometimes that's the most important thing is uh, I have limited time and I need to just get a thing working, especially in something like a live environment. That can be a make or break thing. And the fact that I'm not having to resample files, the fact that I'm not having to panic, I know that it will just work. That's a big thing. And the last thing that I wanted to talk about that Reaper does that I don't know if any other DAW does in quite the same way is accessibility. Accessibility is a big thing and in audio it's getting bigger and bigger as it should. Uh, the, there shouldn't really be any barriers to entry. This is a very technical profession uh, which can make for, you know, people come up with creative solutions to try and make things easier like the uh, spectral peaks thing that I was talking about earlier where it makes everything different colors. Now, uh, what I said earlier with spectral peaks is that they've programmed it in such a way that I can shift the colors around so that if I'm particularly, you know, not sensitive to a particular color, I can shift it around until it works for me. I know you can shift how, uh, how small or how wide those frequency bands are, that kind of thing can make it more useful for you. Um, if you are colorblind, there are themes out there that are designed specifically uh, to avoid particular types of colorblindness and make it easier on the eye. There are ways to make everything on screen larger, really easy. If I go to themes, oh, layouts, I can make things uh, like the, the, the mixer panel 200% size. So everything's suddenly 200% bigger. Um, that's actually quite useful for me because I'm viewing this on quite a big screen. Uh, but if your site isn't the best, that shouldn't stop you from working with audio. And so doing things like this, just buttons in there will change um, the way things are. And it all adapts really, really well um, to the way that Reaper works. There's also the theme adjuster with color controls. So I can customize the entire color scheme uh, so we can make it really bright, we can make it the default, we can do anything like that. And we can even go as far as using something called Osara. Osara is uh, an add-on for Reaper that means that blind people can use Reaper as well. And it reports uh, information about uh, what tracks you're using, uh, whether things are muted, soloed, all the things that you would need to operate Reaper and it works with Reaper 6.3, which as of filming is the latest major revision. Uh, and it's really, really useful. I know somebody who's using Osara very uh, effectively. Uh, that's how I found out about it. Um, is It's out there in the wild and it works. Um, I don't have it installed right now, uh, but I am reliably informed that it means that uh, you can have, it, it's, it's a, a reader. Uh, that it has been tested with uh, NVDA and voiceover screen readers. Uh, so, yeah, on Windows, it uses the Microsoft Active Accessibility uh, system. So, yeah, there are things that Reaper does and is designed for and works with that make it really, really flexible. And I'd like to see the other DAWs doing this. If they are, please let me know in the comments. Um, I'm all for everybody being able to do everything. Uh, but these are things that over the last 10 plus years of using Reaper, the, the fact that they add all this stuff in makes me very happy. Thank you everybody for watching. So thanks everybody. I hope you enjoyed that. Please subscribe and but please get down below. I mean, tell us a little bit about it. If you're a Reaper user, give us some of your tips and tricks. What are the things that you love about it? And of course, don't forget to check out Adam's course. There's a link down there. It's got, he's talking about all the new updates and uh, anything else I've missed, Adam? Oh, yes. Um, something that I decided uh, very recently, the, the video that you've just seen, the track in there, Watch the World by Maceto, um, I'm going to be including that as material in the course. 
as two versions one where all the effects that are on there are already uh, kind of baked in so you can just play around with it and one where it's got the plugins on there that i use whether you own them or not it will say but then you'll have the raw audio to play around with just something that because it's something that i recorded a long time ago we own the masters so it's something i can give to you to be included in the course why not marvelous thanks everybody thanks adam you all rock so long farewell Alvin, Zen, au revoir much. adios adios choose goodbye <laughs>